Hey, Crosspoint, how are you doing on this rainy uh, Sunday in Florida? Everybody doing well? Good. It is good to see you today. For our guest, we warmly welcome you. We are so glad you're here. And for those of you who are watching online, thank you for joining us for this time. I'm so excited about this series. And let me just uh, preface the message today and uh, say if you would like to kind of follow along in this series, I would encourage you to get the book written by Dr. David Jeremiah. It's called, Where Do We Go From Here? He is an expert on Bible prophecy. I am not, and so I am leaning into his knowledge for this series, but I'm super excited about what God is giving us to share during this time. Shortly after Edie and I got married, uh, one day I was praying, and uh, I can be a little melodramatic as a musician. I was 24, 25 at the time, and I said to God, God, time is wasting away. I'm 24, I'm 25, I need to know what you want me to do with my life. And I'll never forget, I was reading Psalm 31, and verses 14 and 15 just jumped off the page. Here's what they say. But I trust in you, O Lord. I'll say you are my God for my, what's the next word? Times are in your hands. That day, an important spiritual line was drawn in my life because I realized that the second, the minutes, the hours, the days, the weeks, the years, the decades of my life are all held in God's hand. Church, I want you to know this today. God orchestrates the days of our life for our good and for his glory. Think about this. God specifically orchestrated that you would be alive during this time in history. Write this down. God wants to use me in this time in history. Our job is not just making it through the day. Our job is to be used by God. Write that down. God wants to use me in this time in history. When we read the story of Esther, one of the verses that just jumps off the page is this verse. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Esther was living in a time of history when the Jews were about to become extinct and Esther risked her own life. She stood in the gap and she ended up saving the Jewish nation. Esther made a big difference in the time that she was living. And then when we read about David, we read these words about David. After David had done the will of God in his own generation, during the time he was living, he died and was buried. David chose to live out God's purposes during the time he was alive. And I don't have to tell you, David made a big difference in history. Church, this is a biblical conviction that you and I need to get a hold of and believe for ourselves. God wants to use us in this time in history. My friend, God chose for you to be alive today. He chose for you to be alive at this moment in history. God ordained, think about this, God ordained that you would serve him in 2022. God wants to use you in this time in history. Here's how David Jeremiah puts it. We are not helpless and our world is not hopeless. Even as the world collapses, the Lord is building his church. Jesus said, I will build my church. We can say something, we can do something, we can pray something, we can preach something, and we can live by the convictions of Christ. Let's keep this in mind as we dig into some prophecy today. A young pastor by the name of Timothy prophesied these words about 1900 years ago. Here's what he said, but understand this, that in the last days, dangerous times of great stress and trouble will come. 
difficult days that will be hard to bear. Now, I don't claim to be a prophet, but church, I do think it is possible that we are living in the last days. And then Jesus spoke these words, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Jesus is saying to us here that his return will take most people by surprise because they will just be busy living their lives. So the big question in this prophetic statement that Jesus makes here is what was it like in the days of Noah? Here's the answer. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Again, I don't claim to be a prophet, but I think this verse paints a picture of the world that we are living in today. We are no longer a Christian nation. We are living in a post Christian society, and that is because evil is subtle. Write that down. Evil is subtle. About 20 years ago, I was having a conversation with a friend about Christianity, and this is what he said to me. He said, my brain is too big to believe that there is only one way to God. 20 years ago, I will tell you, that statement shocked me but here we are, it is 2022, and church, the most recent stats tell us that, get this, 50 to 60% of professing Christians believe the same thing. But here is what's important for us to know today. Jesus prophesied that this would happen. Look at this scripture. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Jesus is saying because evil is subtle, people will be deceived by evil and they will give up on their faith. Only those who live by the convictions of Christ will be saved. Now think about how much the world has changed in the last few years. The values and ideologies that were once the norm are shifting and they are changing all around us. Ideologies like socialism have crept into our country. Worldviews that would have been completely rejected 10 to 20 years ago are being embraced today. Look at this chart. A 2020 poll shows that 40% of Americans had a favorable view of socialism. 47% of millennials and 49% of Generation Z viewed socialism favorably. And I get it. I get it. Socialism sounds really good on the surface. It's kind of like that cool John Lennon song. Do you remember that? Ima here, here are the words. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no country. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. That sounds really good, doesn't it? That sounds like a utopian society, and as a songwriter, I admit that that is a cool song. But church, this song is an example of the subtlety of evil. Because the words of this song, they do not represent an ideology that believers can embrace. Here's why. 
Our society today believes that mankind is the answer to our problems. Christians do not believe this. Christians believe that God and God alone is the answer to our problems. And the only mention of God in this song, if you noticed, is let's get rid of God. And my friends, this is the ideology of socialism. Socialism would make the claim that mankind is the answer, or government is the answer, or a brotherhood of man is the answer. Can I tell you, according to this book, none of these answers are true. Here's why. This book tells us, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Will you say that with me? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. It's really this simple. There is not one example of man governing themselves without the help of God where there has been long-term success. And here's why we can't successfully govern ourselves. Look at this verse. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? All we have to do is go look at the mirror and we know this verse in God's word is true. You see, church, socialism sounds good in concept, but the Bible tells us clearly why socialism doesn't work and can never work. Church, there is no way that we, the people, can govern ourselves without the help of God. Why? Because our hearts are evil. And evil is subtle, and we have all, even those of you who are young, we have all watched the subtlety of evil slowly change the spiritual climate of our nation over the last several decades. We have gotten rid of prayer in our classrooms. We have gotten rid of God in our daily lives. Church attendance is at an all-time low, and evil and evil entertainment is at an all-time high. The truth is, the sad truth, is that we are now living in a post-Christian nation I'm not trying to make a political statement. I am simply stating that some of the effects of socialism are already being felt in our country. And here's the thing. While socialism makes great promises for a utopian society, the roots of socialism are grounded in Marxism. And when we read about the life of Karl Marx, who is responsible for the ID of socialism, we learn some things about him. We learn that he wasn't just a God hater, he was actually a cheerleader for the devil. In fact, he used these words in a poem he wrote, thus heaven I forfeited, I know it full well, my soul once true to God is now chosen for hell. His family thought that he was possessed by a demon in a letter, his son addressed his, fa his father as my dear devil. He was described as a tyrant, a racist, and a misogynistic radical who hated God and wanted to see the world burn. He drank too much, smoked too much, never exercised, and suffered from warts and boils due to lack of washing. He was evicted by his landlord, who was fed up with his filthiness. He never had a job. He mooched off of everyone. He had an illegitimate child with his maid. I don't know how he afforded her. His wife was so miserable that she wanted to die. His two daughters both committed suicide. He was buried in Highgate Cemetery, considered to be the center of Satanism in London. But yet, church, strangely, his ideologies live on today. Karl Marx hated Christianity. He called religion an opium of the people. He believed for communism to succeed, loyalty to the church had to be replaced by loyalty to the state. We are seeing this today. He believed religion was the enemy and a rival to mind control that must be done away with regardless of the cost or difficulties. In other words, Marxism is not compatible with free expression of religion. So think about this in understanding 
socialism. Socialism at its heart does not embrace tolerance or coexisting with others who think differently than you do. Marxism is based on a totalitarianism of ideology. In other words, it is one ideology that seeks to displace any and all prior traditions, institutions, and seeks to bring all aspects of society under the control of the governing ideology of those in charge. Here's what that means. It means truth is whatever the leader decides it is. Cultural Marxism, socialism, thrives on division. It promotes the division of people. The oppressors against the oppressed, bosses against the workers, and the poor against the wealthy. Marxism and socialism respond to most issues by labeling them as racist. We are certainly experiencing this ideology today. And what is sad about this ideology that everything is racist is that it causes the true issues of racism, and we all know there are true issues of racism, to get lost in all the unwarranted accusations of racism that are ungrounded. The greatest tragedy of Marxism is that it is deadly. This has been shocking as I've studied this this week. In 1999, the Black Book of Communism attempted to calculate the death toll for the 20th century due to Marxist Leninist death. And get this, church, the global number was staggering. 92 million deaths due to the ideology of socialism and what it ultimately produces. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Russian novelist and political prisoner, was an eyewitness to the 20 million deaths in Russia alone that were a result of socialism, and he was not fooled by any of it. He wrote, socialism of any type leads to a total destru destruction of the human spirit and to a leveling of mankind into death. Church, here's why we need to talk about this if you feel like I am giving a political speech. Isaiah prophesied these words 2,700 years ago. Here's what he wrote. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This prophetic verse paints a philosophical picture of the world that you and I are living in today. And it comes down to this basic truth, according to Billy Graham. Think about this. Man without God is a contradiction. Man without God is a paradox. Man without God is a monstrosity. Here's why. Because man without God sees evil as good and good as evil. This is why some people love evil and hate that which is good. They are still in their sins. Write this down. Real believers know the difference between good and evil. The reason this is true is because God's grace has been poured out on our life and we have been awakened to our sinfulness apart from him. Paul unwraps this a bit more for us. He writes, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Now look at this, church. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Have you ever met someone who at first they made a really good impression and you thought, wow, I really like that person. They're so charismatic, they're cool. But then as you got to know them and you really begin to see the real person, you realize that they had tricked you into thinking they were something that they were not. That is what Satan does. And this is why John writes to us, these words are prophetic. Check this verse out. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. 
because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Now let's talk about John's prophecy here in a very practical way. And teens, I want you to know that this really applies to you more than anyone else today. There is a cultural war that is raging in our country today. And it represents, the cultural war represents the spiritual battle that we are fighting today. This cultural battle has been designed by Satan to destroy this generation and the following generations. So the question for us this morning becomes, how do we engage in the cultural war? How do we fight this spiritual battle? Church, the answer is we need to find a way to let our voices as believers be heard. When we see something that is in opposition, now hear me, to our biblical convictions, not our personal convictions or our political convictions, but our biblical convictions, we need to stop, think about it, and then carefully speak the truth in a loving and caring way. I just heard about a youth group in Jacksonville, Florida that did this very thing. They gathered at a mall and they protested the sale of X-rated Christmas ornaments. They were called pornaments. Never heard of them, just saying. They were sold in a well-known chain store across the country. If I named the store, you would recognize it. But as a result of this peaceful protest, a news reporter a few days later reported that about a half of the stores had taken these X-rated ornaments off of the shelves simply because a youth group had taken the time and energy to say it was wrong. Here's the simple truth, church. If you and I only let the people who do not have our values do all the talking, they will end up shaping our culture and the culture of the next generation. We see this happening all around us, but church, as I quoted earlier, hear me. As believers, we are not helpless and our world is not hopeless. Even as the world collapses, the Lord is still building his church. You and I, we can say something, we can do something, we can pray something, we can preach something, and we can live by the convictions of Christ. The cultural war that is going on is a spiritual battle for the hearts and souls and minds of this generation. Church, today, we need to find a way to speak truthfully and respond lovingly to the present time we are living in for the sake of this generation. Because here is the truest reality that we have as believers. Listen to this verse through the grid of what I've just said and through the grid of what's going on in our world today. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So let's talk about a few action points that we can take. Let's talk about how we should live in light of this truth. Church, God wants to use us in this time. He doesn't want us to roll over and play dead. We know that evil is subtle. Well, we also know that real believers know the difference between good and evil. So how can you and I live out our biblical convictions? Number one, write this down. We need to remember God's faithfulness. We need to remember God's faithfulness. Let me ask you a question. What percentage of people come to faith in Christ because of a personal testimony? 
This is going to blow your minds. It did mine this week. 75 to 90 percent of the people that come to faith do so because a friend or a relative shared their testimony. Only five to six percent of people come to faith through a pastor's preaching. When it comes to evangelism, you guys are far more relevant than I am. Here's the point. When you share your testimony, what are you doing? You are remembering God's faithfulness in your life. Now think about this. Let's unwrap this a bit. Look at this quote. Socialism wants you to forget. Christianity wants you to remember. During the rise of communism, the famous Czech writer Milan Kundera wrote, the first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, its history, then have someone write new books, manufacture a new culture, and invent a new history. Before long, that nation will forget what it is and what it was. This is happening in our world today. Church, in contrast, here's why we have to talk about this. In contrast, do you know how many times this book uses the word remember? 164 times. I would submit to you that the word remember is a spiritual word. God spoke these words to the prophet Isaiah. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Church, remembering and sharing God's faithfulness is one of the ways that we can live out our biblical convictions. Number two, write this down. Revere your family unit. Revere your family unit. Think about this, church. When God started our world, how did he start it? He created a family. He began with Adam and Eve, and God told them, be fruitful and multiply. And he made it fun to be fruitful and multiply, right? Adam and Eve sinned against God. But God did not give up on the family. Instead, he used Abraham and his family to establish an everlasting covenant. Think about this, church. The promise of Jesus and the plan of our redemption was revealed by God to us. How? Through a family. And when God sent Jesus to earth, he didn't send him to join a kingdom or the religious people of the day. He didn't send Jesus to come to earth to campaign and win an election. When Jesus, think about this, when God incarnate came to earth, he joined a family. The angel told Mary, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. So think about this, okay? Socialism wants to destroy the family and establish government. And we are seeing this happen in our world today. On the other hand, God wants to exalt the family and use the family to reveal his will to mankind. When I think of Cross Point Family Church, I think of all the wonderful family units that are represented here. And as your pastor, I say to you today, Revere your family unit. One of the very best ways to live out our biblical convictions is to make and keep our family strong. Amen? Number three, we need to respect all authority. Go ahead and groan, okay? We need to respect all authority. In some ways, I think this may be harder to do today than it's ever been because so many leaders have abused their authority. But church, let me give you the biblical basis for this action point. Here's how Paul says we should respond to authority. And let me just tell you, if you would say, well, Harv, he didn't know the world we're living in. The world that Paul was living in, Nero was the leader. Do you know what he did? He cut Christians' heads off. He stuck them on a pole, poured tar over them, and then set them on fire to light up the night sky. 
okay? And then during that time, he wrote this. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. So my friends, everyone who is in authority today is someone that God specifically put in authority, and our job as believers is to show them respect. Here's why. For he, this is what the verse said, and I would add she or anyone in authority. Anyone in authority, look at this, is God's servant to, what are the next three words? Do you good. This verse is saying that God views those in authority as his ministers to maintain order here on earth. Our job is to respect them, period. One of the best ways that you and I can live out our biblical convictions today is to respect our president and respect those in authority. And we do that by refusing to gossip about them, speak poorly about them, and we also do that by praying for them. Amen. Number four, we review and do what God's word says. Write that down. We review and do what God's word says. Church, heaven and earth will pass away, but what is written in this book will never pass away. Do you know who spoke those words? Jesus. Not Harv. Not even a prophet. Not even one of the disciples. Jesus spoke those words. So those words are pretty important for us. Heaven and earth will pass away, but what has been written in this book, according to Jesus, will never pass away. Several years ago, we had a guest speaker at our church, back at First Church, and uh, she read one of those rub passages in the Bible. We all know what I'm talking about. The next day, we got a phone call from a certain family that did not like uh, what she had read from God's Word, and they proceeded to tell us that they didn't care what God's Word said, that they had their own thoughts on the subject. Uh, needless to say, that family isn't involved in church today. I'm not sure that they're involved in any church today. My understanding is that they are suffering spiritually as a family. And here's why. And church, this is where prophecy gets tough. And this is why I started off cheerleading last week. Because I knew that this prophetic series was going to get tough. So listen to these words of prophecy. This is what God says through Hosea. My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. This is a book of knowledge. And because you have rejected knowledge, here's what God says, I will reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. I said this last week, but it is certainly worth saying again. Church, if our convictions are not grounded in the word of God, they are simply opinions. I have my opinions just like everybody else, but we, we all know that opinions are here today and gone tomorrow. Church, one of the best ways that you and I can live out our biblical convictions is to review and then do what God's word says. Amen? Number five, this is my favorite one. We need to resolve to follow Christ. Write that down. We need to resolve to follow Christ. I recently had the privilege of marrying Brent and Mickey Williams. And, uh, woohoo! <laughs> and they wrote their own vows. And one of the vows, every time they said it, I got so choked up. Uh, one of the vows they made to one another goes like this. I will follow God completely with you. That is the best wedding vow a person can make. And church, it is my challenge for us as a church body. We need to vow to one another. We need to make a public and personal pledge to resolve to follow Christ completely. Here's the thing, church. There are way too many believers today who admire Jesus, but they do not follow him. Let me say this to you today, admiration 
is not enough. We are living in a time where admiration for Jesus will not be enough. We must resolve to follow Jesus completely. You see, the lines are being drawn very clearly between those who give Jesus lip service and those who give Jesus life service. And Jesus makes it very clear for us. Listen to his words. Jesus says to us today, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. Why? Because I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Now, church, this verse calls for some deep level understanding on our part. So let me try to unwrap this for us, okay? You see, there is an overlapping reality for us. Because when we follow Jesus on one hand, the world hates us because they see in us what they should be, and it convicts them. But on the other hand, church, they are drawn towards us because they see Jesus in us. They see all that is kind in us. They see all that is good. They see all that is holy. They see all that is just, and we make them thirsty for Jesus. So you see, the problem is an overlapping reality here. But there is no middle ground in our response. Jesus lays down the gauntlet for us with these words. Anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one's own life, can't be my disciple. Anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me can't be my disciple. Simply put, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, you can't be my disciple. I have a young friend, his name is Isaiah, and one of our favorite topics that we like to talk about is the posture of true believers. And we talk about this every time we get together. We talk about how this is not the posture of a true follower of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? This is not the posture of a true believer. This, like you a lot, Jesus, I'm a fan. That's not the posture of a true believer. Let me show you the posture of a true believer. It looks like this. We talk about this, that when the church, when the world looks at the church, and when the world looks at the believer, and they really see us shouldering our cross, they will either hate us or they will be drawn to Jesus because they see him in us. But there is no middle ground in our response. The very best way, I think out of all of these action points, the very best way to live out our biblical convictions is to resolve to follow Jesus completely. Church, God wants to use us in this time in history. And while evil is subtle, real believers know the difference between good and evil. And church, we embrace what is good by living out our biblical convictions. Let me remind you one more time of what we talked about today. We remember, everybody say remember. We remember God's faithfulness. We revere our family units. Everybody say revere. We respect all authority. Everybody say respect. We review what God's word says. Say review. And we resolve to follow Jesus. Everybody say resolve. Church, this is how we make a difference in this time in history.
Let's pray together. Father, we have sensed your presence in this place. You are here, you are speaking, and we are grateful. We know that you want to use us in this time in history. We know that evil is subtle, but we know because we know you, we know the difference between good and evil. So help us to embrace what is good by living out biblical convictions. Father, I pray in greater measure that you would convict each one of us here to remember your faithfulness and talk about your faithfulness. May we revere our family units. May we treasure and cherish our family. May the world look on and see there's something unique about that family. May we respect all authority. God, forgive us. We've become way too loose in this area. We bless our president, Joe Biden, right now in the name of Jesus. May we review what God's word says. May we understand that, Jesus, you're the one who said heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. And may we resolve to follow Jesus completely. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, church, I just want to, um, I want to personally invite you to the chosen, okay? Tonight, we are going to watch my very favorite episode. I've watched it five times. It's so good. It's episode one of season two. And uh, it's, it's a great springboard for a conversation. So if you like movies or if you like television shows, I warmly welcome you to join us tonight at five. And uh, it's at a perfect time because at one, um, the Buccaneers are going to beat the Eagles. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> It's going to be fun at his house. We're going, I'm going to his house today. So, um, And then, you know, for me, uh, 5 o'clock, I'm coming back to the church, and then I'm going to get home in time to see Kansas City beat the Steelers, right? <laughs> so, see, you won't be missing a thing. So I want to invite you. Hey, God bless you. Have a great, have a great day. We'll see you next week. <laughs>